Today we're at um, this event for the Sowers and Rippers. Uh, we're gathering for tea and friendship. That's our theme, just to enjoy the day and the ministry that God has blessed us with. Through the ministry, we have developed friendships that have just been amazing because we can support one another, cry with one another, and just be friends. It's a real gift from God. Yeah, today there's a hundred ladies that are attending and um, sores and rippers that come every week and then they're guests so yes. they can find out about sores and rippers. Yes, we want to pass the word because it's such a wonderful ministry. We've all benefited and of course it all began with just about a half a dozen ladies and some of them are still with us today. Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Dave here, along with Pastor Ryan. We are so glad you joined us here today. Whether you're online or in person, thanks for choosing to be at Auburn Grace this morning. Right in the middle of a new series with Pastor Phil on generosity. And uh, we thank you for your generosity and your, your continued support Absolutely. of the work at Auburn Grace. Now listen, a week from today, right after church, we got a really fun activity that I think you're gonna love. Yeah, we, we call it Family Fest Barbecue. Now, I'm from North Carolina, the yes. South. And barbecue, that means pork, pork. you know. Yeah. We're having hot dogs, that's sort of like pork, depending yeah, on, Yeah, you know. right. We'll, we'll, we'll try to pick just the right dogs. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have something picked out for you. But um, it's gonna be a great time to meet other families within our church. So if you have a kid in your house, whether that's a baby, through students, yeah. whatever it may be, we want you to stay after church. It's a free event, it costs you nothing. <laughs> We're gonna be going out behind the cafe in the parking lot there. We'll have some yard games we'll be yeah. doing, little cornhole kind of hanging out and just fellowship. And maybe you've seen other families around here that you don't know. This is a great time to connect. You bet, you bet. So, it's gonna be wonderful. Yeah, it's gonna be an awesome time. I wanna encourage you to come out for that. Yep. Now jumping into May real quick, just so you get it on your calendar. So National Day of Prayer. Yeah, National Day of Prayer, Thursday, May the 2nd. Starts at 7 a.m. Right, right here in the yep. worship center. We'll be doing some breakfast, lots of coffee to get you going, and then followed by a time of prayer and just praying okay. for our nation. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we are in great need of Absolutely. prayer. Absolutely, we might need more than an hour, but we, we might we could stay probably all day and not even scratch the surface. <laughs> exactly. But mark your calendars, please. Thursday, May two. Yes. Uh, we want to let you know um, Vision ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay, so we are officially launching the next section of ten, eleven, and twelve. And last time we called it all in. This next session is called Forward, and we're pressing forward with the vision that the Lord has given to us. Absolutely. So mark your calendars. We're going to have a lot of details coming up, but we're going to have a Saturday and a Sunday. It's going to be our official launch. So we are excited about God moving mm -hmm. forward, the vision that he's put before us. Okay, now let's see. Coming up this Friday... Mm -hmm. Ladies Ministry is sponsoring their Ladies Night Out. Yep. We had a little video we played a couple of weeks ago. We're going to show it to you again before we kick over to Brian and the worship team because we changed the date. Yep. Okay? Not the people. Just the not date. Not the subject. Just, just the, the date. date. Mm -hmm. So let's check out our, our video of Ladies Night Out and then we'll kick it over to Brian and the worship team. Thanks so much for joining us here today at Auburn Grace. Let's see what my mom's yeah, doing. Yeah, let's check out. Oh, mom, what are you making? Well, I'm trying to make cookies for my Sunday school teachers, but this is proving to be so challenging. Ooh, yeah, we can see that. Well, hey, 
If you want to learn how to make an easy treat, then you should definitely come to our upcoming ladies' night out because we're having a professional pastry chef come teach us how to make Brazilian truffles. Ooh, I love truffles. Can I come? I don't know where the truffle is, but can I come too? Actually, girls, you can. Because for this ladies' night out, we're encouraging women to bring the little ladies in their lives, like their daughters, granddaughters, nieces, neighbors. Truffles are so easy; they don't even require baking. Yay! <laughs> Well, obviously, count me in. When yep. is it? Friday, April 19th, starting at 5.30 at Auburn Grace. We'll have dinner together and then learn how to make the truffles, even enough to make a little box to take home as like a gift to somebody. I can't wait to tell Emily and Mrs. Adams about this. I'm sure they would love to come too. I'm sure they would. Yeah, that's a great idea. And you know what too, Annabelle? This is a great event for you to invite friends that don't normally come to church, like from school or sports. I can invite my friend Annika from school. Well, all of that sounds amazing, but I have one more question. What's that? Who's gonna help me clean this up? Not oh, it! Not it, yeah. Sorry, you are on your own with that. I will be there on Friday. Women of the church, I hope you can make it too. Uh, would you stand with me? We're gonna get into um, a time of worship. And I pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us um, through another week and to the start of our new week, um, for bringing us to this time of renewal. And God, I just recognize that we're all coming from different places, different households, um, different things going on in our lives. Um, and so we just look to you for peace and joy um, and renewal. We do want renewal this morning, God, and so would you speak to us? Amen. In my past behind I'm setting my heart 
Yeah.
And Lord God, we, we are so in awe of your power, of your sovereignty, Lord. You, you spun everything into time. You created everything we see. You, you are master of the universe. You authored salvation. You did all these amazing things, and yet you stoop so low to each and every one of us. You want to call us friend. You are trying to find a way to reconcile to us, even though we are in the wrong. Lord, we are so in awe of you. Please help us really understand the power of your presence. Please help us feel you today and know that you are always with us. Please prepare us to hear your word today. Please just help us know another aspect of you that we hadn't understood previously. We love you so much. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys turn and say hi to one another? Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. I wish we could figure this weather thing out, can't we? Wouldn't that be great? We were sweating on Thursdays, freezing on Friday, sweating on this Wednesday again. But you know what? The eclipse, the eclipse happened and we're all still here. We're all still here. We made it through. Okay. We made it through. Hey, welcome to you. Great singing today. It's great. You know, if you're watching online, we want to say welcome to you, but we want to encourage you to come on and join us, uh, that we can sing at home and pray at home, but there's just something about doing it together, and I think that's why the scriptures tell us to do it together, so we're glad that you're here today. Hey, as was announced on the video next Sunday after church, we're just going to have a fun event that's totally free. We're calling it our Family Fest Barbecue. And so if you're new here at Auburn Grace or you have a family with some students or young kids, we just want to get that, that, those young families together to meet each other. It's going to just be out in the courtyard and stuff. You don't have to bring anything or sign up. So in this event that we're having, uh, having next, uh, next Sunday after church. Also, uh, as we look forward to this summer, you know, uh, here at Auburn Grace, we are a volunteer-driven church. Uh, we're not a staff-driven church. And so what that means is we create as many opportunities for you as the congregation to use your passions and the gifts that God's given to you. And so this summer, as you're looking for an opportunity maybe to volunteer, we have a new page on our website, auburngrace.com. And uh, if you go to the link menu, there's a link that says AG Teams, and those are our volunteer teams. And we have a, a couple of uh, opportunities on there, uh, especially as we focus on next generation. We're really putting a big emphasis on next generation and impacting our students and our young adults and young families and our children. And uh, if you want to be involved in that, uh, the, our children ministry is looking for some new partners in the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds and the kindergartners uh, during the second service so there's some opportunities on that you can go to auburngrace.com and go on to AG teams and uh, just look at the menu there of opportunities to serve and use your gifts and your talents we really believe God has put gifts inside of each one of us that we can share with each other and help each other grow in the Lord and I can't be all that God wants me to be unless you help me and you can't be all that God wants you to be unless I help you as well. So turn to your neighbor and say, I need Phil's help. I need Phil's help today. <laughs> Hey, uh, in a couple of weeks, we have a super great community event going on. We have the Rodeo coming to town. And the last couple of years, uh, our church has had some banners and some other things. We want to help sponsor the Rodeo. Uh, we love being involved in local events. 
hold some events here in our community. And so uh, we don't have money in our budget to sponsor the rodeo, but if you'd like to help us sponsor that, we'd like to have some banners up around the arena. You know, I just wanted to just, you know, a couple of years ago, by the way, Kevin Borden and his wife are right down here. He's in charge of the rodeo. And uh, uh, he asked me if we would help a couple of years ago because one of their sponsors for their shoots had dropped out, wanted to know if we wanted to have an Auburn Grace Community Church shoot where all the steers and Bronx come out of. And I said, absolutely. So I think we were shoot number four. And uh, every time a Bronc or a Buck, I mean a Bronc or a steer came out of that shoot, the announcer would announce. And now in Auburn Grace Community Church's you know, uh, shoot number four. Now the last steer that came out, true story, the last steer that came out was named the big guy. So we had the big guy. <laughs> Coming out of shoot number four, Auburn Grace Community Church. So we've been part of that event. If you want to help with that, we'd love to help you help, help us sponsor that event. You can let the church office know if you want to be It's a great time. And by the way, they're having Cowboy Church in two weeks down at the fairgrounds at 10 o'clock in the arena. If you want to go hang out with a bunch of cool cowboys and cowgirls, you can have church down there at 10 o'clock. So uh, we want to do that, be part of that. So thanks for, for, thanks for all that. Thanks for what you're doing, Kevin, and uh, for all you're doing. All right, we've been going through this short series in 2 Corinthians. It's a book in your Bible, second part of your Bible called the New Testament. Right about in the middle, there's a book called, a letter called 2 Corinthians, and we're in chapters 8 and 9. We've been talking about having a heart of generosity. Having a heart of generosity. Uh, George Barna, who studies Christians and Christian movements in our culture today, says this. He says this, born again adults remain the most generous givers in a country that is acknowledged to be the most generous on the planet that the most generous on the planet, the most generous country on the planet is us. And among those in our culture that are generous, followers of Jesus seem to be the highest rated genera uh, generous people. So we're looking at the opportunity to have a generous heart. Now, we know if God, we believe the Bible teaches us that when God created us in our mother's womb, he knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew exactly who our parents would be, and he knew exactly what generation we would be born into. And so if God had us be born in this country, in this generation, and we're the most generous, generous country on the planet, what that should tell us is God wants us to make an impact with our lives that he strategically brought you here or had you be born in this country in this generation so that we living in the most prosperous country in the world can make an impact for his work and for his people are literally around the world. Now I know as things are going crazy in our culture, I was driving to church this morning and the gas station where I get gas is 30 cents a gallon more than it was last Sunday when I drove to church. Okay, and I know the prices of our groceries are growing up and our, and our, our utility bills are, gro are growing up, are going up, and uh, going out to dinner and going out to, everything is, is crazy. And our natural human reaction is to be like a turtle and we just go into our financial shell and we just hold on. And we lose the opportunity to make an impact. So I thought it would be great for us just to spend three weeks in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. There's seven principles of how to change lives in these two chapters. And, and let's review quickly the first three because I think they all kind of go in a little bit of an order. We saw last week that generosity is about my attitude, not my bank statement. We learned last week that generosity is the attitude of begging us, as, they, as, as we find in the beginning of chapter eight, begging us with much urgency for the favor of participation. A generous heart is someone that says, wow, I want to help others. I want to make an impact. And making an impact in the lives of other people is a favor that I get to participate in, not a burden that I have to do. Now, the immediate story of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is simply this. Paul was a missionary in the first century, and he left from Antioch. You can see that city up on the far right, Antioch. And he traveled around the known world, either starting churches or helping churches. This is his second missionary journey. And down in the bottom right, you see the city of Jerusalem where Christianity was birthed out of. 
And, and Paul knows that the Christians in Jerusalem are having a really hard time. There's a famine in the land, they're being afflicted with persecution, and so most of the Christians in Jerusalem have way more month than money. And they're hurting, and they're hungry, And so Paul is going around to the churches in the known world and he's asking them, hey, would you be generous to your brothers and sisters down there in Jerusalem? Would you be willing to gather some funds together and so, and and have us take a bountiful gift to help your brothers and sisters? And the churches said, yes, we'd love to participate in that. And so now during this time of missionary journey, his second missionary journey, Paul is going around and he's collecting this gift to take down to Jerusalem. And he's getting ready, he's going from Thessalonica at the top there, down to Corinth, and he knows that the people of Corinth are excited to participate in this event to help the needy people in Jerusalem. The problem in Corinth is they haven't actually done it yet. They said a year ago, we can't wait to do it, we're gonna do it, we love to help our brothers and sisters, but Paul has heard a report saying they're all excited and they're ready, they just haven't pulled the trigger. And so while Paul is up in the north, he's writing this letter to the Corinthians saying, hey, I'm coming through town in just a little while, a couple of months, can you go ahead and take that? Because I don't don't want that to be something that we deal with while I'm there, just take the offering so when I'm there, our team can pick it up and take it down to Jerusalem. But generosity isn't more about my attitude than it is about my bank statement. We saw last week quickly that generosity is an outcome, not an initiator. I don't wake up one morning and decide I'm gonna be more generous today. The way that I become more generous in my heart is says, says of the Macedonian churches, they first gave themselves to the Lord. And so my relationship with God is, is really tied to my heart of generosity. And, and the more that I give myself to the Lord, the more he's gonna create in me a generous heart. I don't initiate a generous heart. I give myself to God. He gives me the perspective on life. He gives me the understanding of why he has me here on this planet to make an impact. And he un- gives me an understanding of the resources of my time and my energy and my money so how to make an impact for his people and for his kingdom they first gave themselves to the Lord so generosity is an outcome we saw that last week and then finally number three last week we saw that generosity is invalidated if it's mandated if Paul was going to command these folks to give a gift to the folks in Jerusalem if he was going to compel them to do it then that's not really generosity is it I mean, when you get your utility bill in the mail, do you consider it generosity that you pay it? Is that an act of generosity? The answer is no, because it's mandated. And we wrapped up last week by also noticing that generosity is invalidated if it just remains a desire. I can wanna be generous all I want, but if I don't actually do anything, then am I really a generous person? And the problem that Paul was trying to stir in Corinth is that they had made a lot of promises to do it, but they hadn't actually done it. So he wants to encourage them to do that. So we're in chapter eight this morning, verse 13. And let's look at three more principles quickly, and then next week we'll wrap this up. We're only spending three weeks on this topic. Principle number four, generosity is a hand up, not a hand out. Let's read verses 13 down through verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter eight. For this is not for the ease of others, this giving of this gift, or for your affliction by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equity, or excuse me, equality. As it is written, he who gathers much did not have too much, and he who gathers little had no lack. Paul says, you know, when you take this love offering for the people in Jerusalem, you're not giving money to them just so they can live on easy street. And you're not giving money to them over and over and over and over again. You're giving them a hand up, you're not giving them a hand out. Paul Paul tells them this is not for their ease. In other words, the folks in Jerusalem can expect multiple gifts. They're going through some tough times. They're going through some difficulties. But this is not a welfare system for the poor. And then he says there, and for your affliction, being a generous person 
isn't meant to demand more and more and more and more and more from you. Giving to the folks in Jerusalem, Paul says, it's a one-time shot. I'm not coming around every year asking for more. It's not to be meant as a burden. It's to be meant as an opportunity, as an opportunity. Now, there's a word in those three verses that is repeated twice that in our culture today is a little bit of a trigger word, isn't it? What word is it? Did you hear it? Equality. When we stand up in our culture to say, let's have equality, we all get triggered because it means so many different things. The word equality here that Paul is using is simply the word balance. That generosity, watch this, balances things. Generosity is the balance in life and it's accomplished through reciprocity. Notice what Paul says, your abundance being a supply for their need. So, so they're in need, you have a little bit more, and when you are generous, it brings them up a little bit, and life is what? It's balanced. And then sometime you're gonna be down, and they're gonna be a little bit up, and when they express generosity to you, which is reciprocity, they're balanced, and you're up. We're all balanced, being a part of their supply. And then there's a quote there, very interesting, a quote out of the Old Testament, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered a little had no lack. Well, that's a quote from the Old Testament from the story of Moses. When Moses was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness wanderings for 40 years, God provided food for them every day. And the food that he provided was two types of food. The bread he provided through this thing called what? Manna. Manna was this flaky stuff that when the dew of the morning dried up, there was this flaky flour on the ground. And you would, you would scoop it up and you would bake your bread for the day. Do you know what the word manna means itself? It means, what is it? <laughs> they didn't know what it was, okay? Have you ever gone to somebody's house and had manna? You don't know what it is. When I, was back in, when I was back in college and we'd go through that food line, sometimes we'd go, it's manna again, because we don't know what they're serving us. But when they scooped up the manna and they baked their bread for the day, manna was only good for one day. If you woke up the next morning, yesterday's was spoiled if you had any left over, and God wanted to demonstrate he was gonna provide their needs every single day day so you couldn't carry today's manna into tomorrow. So what they understood was if I gathered mine in the morning and I baked my bread and at dinner time I had leftover bread but my neighbor didn't have enough because they didn't scoop enough that day, I'm gladly giving them my stuff because it's not going to last until morning and so there if I gather much I'm not going to have too much because tomorrow I got to do it again and if they have lack they're not going to be too lacking because I'm going to give them the rest. Does that make sense? It's this balance and they experience this balance on a daily basis with the manna. That's what Paul's referring to there. So there's a, a great reminder that generosity balances the highs and the lows of life. That sometimes people are up, and sometimes people are down. And when I'm up, God has, let me, God has allowed me to be up because maybe he wants me to be a little bit generous to those that are down and balance life out. I'm not gonna have too much, and they're not gonna lack. And again, it's not a welfare system. It's not a perpetual giving to that person. If somebody gets down and gets up, that should be the end of it because people should be able to handle themselves. In fact, in, in, in the book of Galatians, there's an interesting contrast. In Galatians chapter six and verse two, look what Paul writes to the Galatian church. He says there, bear one another's what? burden and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Well, wow. if you're going to if you tag on the law of Christ, that elevates the principle pretty high. So bearing one another's burdens apparently is very important. But if you go to verse 5, it says for each one will bear his own what? His own load. And that seems a little bit contradictory, doesn't it? 
that we're supposed to bear each other's burdens but carry your own load. And it seems contradictory until you understand what the word pictures are behind those two words. The word burden is a mule pack that you place on an animal to carry because it's way too large for an individual to carry. And the word load there is a backpack. And here's the principle, everyone must carry your own backpack. That, that you have responsibilities, I have responsibilities. I have responsibilities in my job, I have responsibilities in my family, I have responsibilities in my finances, I have responsibilities that are in my backpack and you shouldn't have to carry my own personal responsibilities. That would be a bad stewardship of my life. But there are times when my life doesn't just have a backpack of burden, it becomes a mule pack of burden because I'm going through so much stuff in my life that life load has moved from a backpack to a mule pack and I can't carry it, folks, and I need you to help me carry it. And that's when we step in and we help each other. We help each other. You know, when I became the pastor here at Auburn Grace, our church was in tremendous financial difficulty. We had just finished completing this building when I became the lead pastor here, and, and we were in dire financial straits for a lot of reasons. And our mortgage was held by our denomination and the headquarters of our financial arm of the denomination. That leader came out to see me, and, and Lord bless him, he came out and said, Phil, this is your spending priorities for your church. You need to pay the pastor. You need to pay your bills in the communities to keep a good testimony in Auburn, and then pay us what you can at the end of the month. And I said, thank you, that's very generous of you. And for four years we did that, and we were up and down, behind, and God would catch us up. But we were in tremendous financial straits here. We couldn't do anything, we had, everything was old, everything was broken. And our elders began to say, you know, this is not a good way to lead our church. And at the same time, the, the leader of that financial department in our fellowship retired and a new guy came in to that position and he flew out here to see me and he took me out to lunch and he said, Phil, I want you to change your spending priorities. I want you to pay us first. And I want you to pay your pastor second and your bills third. And I was mad. And I said, just put a for sale sign on the building. You're asking the impossible. And I went to the next elders meeting and I told them, this clown from Winona Lake, Indiana. Because <laughs> it was, those four years financially were so hard. And I said, this guy wants us to change our spending priorities. And that would mean that 80% of every Sunday's offering has to go to our mortgage payment. And only 20% to survive as a church. And one of, our, one of our dear elders opened up the Bible and he said this, a borrower is a slave to the lender. We were the borrower, he was the lender. And that elder said, if that's what the lender wants us to do, we have to do it biblically. And so we flipped our spending priorities. And I want you to know for the next three months it was a summer Ruthie and I got no money. We had four young children. We had just purchased our first home. And we got zero money. And immediately, we went what? Down. But you know what started happening is somebody in the church that had a little bit of extra food would drop it off on our front doorstep. Because our cupboards were empty. And somebody that had a little bit extra would drop a couple hundred dollars down so that we could maybe make our mortgage payment. We could pay our utility bills. And at the end of those three months, another church in town, God bless them, called Sunrise Church, came in and rented this building from us and we moved out to a storefront where we could get back in balance financially. And for those three months, people at Auburn Grace gave generously so we could be balanced. And it was so humbling, but it was so wonderful to see God's people at work. Because see, generosity isn't about giving someone, the same person, money month after month after month after month to create a lifestyle. Generosity is just how we balance life. And sometimes I'm the one in need, 
And sometimes I have a little bit extra and I find someone else in need. So equality means balance in life. Balance in life. Do you have, a, have you ever in your washing machine had an uneven load? <laughs> right? I mean, washing machines are designed to spin smoothly, but every once in a while you throw all the towels or the sheets in the wrong, in one side, and what happens? It goes from whoo to the thump, the thump, and the machine's walking across the room, okay? Okay? Why? Because it's out of balance. Have you ever wondered why our earth spins so fast but so smoothly? I mean, our earth is spinning. Now, we can't feel it because it's so large, but it's spinning so fast that it rotates one time every 24 hours. Why doesn't it do a washing machine maneuver? I'll tell you why, because God created our world in balance. We have high mountains, and we have low depths of the sea. We have water, we have land, and God in his brilliance created a perfectly balanced earth. There are some high points, there are some low points, and they balance each other out. E equality means we are balancing life out. So when I'm generous, it's to bring balance. It's to bring balance. Principle number three is found in verses 16 down through verse 24, the end of chapter eight. It's a, it's a pretty long paragraph, and it's fascinating that Paul spends so many verses on the next principle, but principle number five is generous gifts must be managed with integrity. Uh, apparently there were some rumors or accusations going around that Paul is wanting to collect all this money, and he says he's gonna take it for the needs in Jerusalem, but really, he's just gonna go on a vacation. He wants to spend the money on himself. And, and so Paul's gonna spend these verses talking about, hey, the people and the process of how you handle generosity is super important. It's super important. And so in this section, in this paragraph, Paul's gonna mention some people and he's gonna mention some processes about how to handle generous gifts. Let's look and see what he says. Verse 16, but thanks be to God who put the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of who? Titus. Titus was one of the leaders that was really excited about helping the people in Jerusalem. And he says there in verse 17, for Titus not only accepted our appeal, but, he, he, but being himself very earnest, he has gone on to you of his own accord. He's paying his own way. We have sent along with Titus, the brother whose fame in all the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. And what's interesting is this is a man of mystery. We don't know who it is. But somebody is accompanying Titus who is managing the collection of this gift to take to Jerusalem. Look at verse 19. Not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work. In other words, the churches had input on how the process of carrying and managing this gift was to take place which is being administered for us by, for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. Verse 20, taking precaution so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. Paul didn't want anybody to think that this generous gift he's taken to Jerusalem was somehow gonna personally benefit him. So he wanted the process of collecting the money and carrying the money to be one of integrity so people wouldn't think he was personally benefiting. Verse 21, for we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. God, I mean, Paul wants people to know that how they're collecting the money, how they're carrying the money, and how they're gonna distribute the money in Jerusalem is gonna be done in such a process of integrity that it brings honor to them, I mean, honor to the Lord, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be respectful to the people that gave it. Verse 22, We've set with them our brother whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things. So the people that were on this team were tested. Why? Because 
handling money can be so tempting. And you can imagine taking a big chest of cash from Corinth to Jerusalem. It'd be easy to stop along the way and buy a new dress and dip into it for some nice steak dinners. So the people that were gonna carry the chest down to Jerusalem were first tested to make sure they were people of character. He says there, they found diligent in many things, verse 22, even now more diligent because of his great, uh, his great confidence in you. As for Titus, verse 23, he is my partner and fellow worker among you, for as our brethren, they are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. Therefore, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of the reason for boasting about you. Paul is saying, listen, the people that are collecting the money, the finance team, and the finance team that is carrying the war chest of bountiful gift down to Jerusalem, you can trust these people because we've tested them. What is that telling us? It's telling us that generous gifts must be managed with integrity. Generosity must be managed by people of integrity. Look at the phrases that he's using here. Being himself a very earnest, appointed by the churches, so the churches were involved, tested and found diligent. Not anybody should just be allowed to touch the money. He also tells us there that generosity must be managed through a process of integrity. Look at the phrases. For the glory of the Lord himself, taking precautions so that no one discredits us, regard for what is honorable in the sight of the Lord and in the sight of men. What's he saying? Generosity demands an honest team and best practices. And I want you to know here at Auburn Grace, we take it seriously. I thank the Lord for the people that handle your generosity here. I am not one of them. Oh, that's not good to say, is it? Like, I. <laughs> you can't trust me. Wow, that sounds terrible. Actually, you know, uh, I, I just want to thank the Lord. Over the years here, people, you don't know these people Bob Riley, Bob Churchwell, uh, Tom Bowen. Um, you know, Kristen Davis, her team, you know, people that have just been so faithful in making sure that the process of your generosity is handled with integrity. And it's, it's an act of integrity that the senior pastor is not involved in the process of finances here. That's a sign of integrity. It's not a sign of lack of character, it's a sign of integrity. <laughs> In the process, I just want, I don't have access to the checkbook. I get reports. Um, I can't spend the money here other than my own little church credit card. But I, and I'm held, Kristen holds me accountable for all my receipts, okay? <laughs> the reason that we allow our whole congregation to see the proposed budget every June is because we want to be transparent. Our members vote on it. It's not a budget that we approve just as a leadership team. It's a budget that the members approve. And then after we close the books at the end of June, by the end of July, we, we open up another report telling you how we spent your generosity last year. Why? Because generous gifts need to be handled with integrity. And it need to be by a group of people with integrity and a process of integrity. It's fascinating to me that Paul would spend such a big segment of his discussion on that topic. And then finally, let's creep into chapter nine just for a little bit as we wrap things up this morning. Principle number six, generosity must result in an actual giving, not just in willingness. This is a, a little bit of a repeat from last week, principle number three. Let's look at verse one. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints, for I know, and there's the word, your readiness. The Corinthian people were ready to give. It says, which I boast about you to the Macedonians. That's the churches in the north. The churches in the north, Thessalonica, Philippi, and Berea, they were going through much poverty. They were going through much affliction. And when Paul came up there to tell them about the needs of the saints in Jerusalem, Paul said, you won't believe how eager the Corinthians are to give toward this. And the Macedonian churches said, wow, if the Corinthian people will do it, we'll do it. The problem is the Corinthian people hadn't done it. <laughs> You can look there in verse 20, I mean in verse two, for I know your readiness of which I boast to the Macedonians, namely that in Achaia you've been prepared since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. 
But I have sent a brother, and he said, in order that your boasting about you, that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that as I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not speaking of you, will be put to shame in this confidence. Paul says, you know, I'm coming, to, to, I'm coming from, from Macedonia down to Corinth, and, I, and I've told them how excited you guys are to give to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and that got them excited, and they took a big collection, and now I'm coming down to you, and I'm bringing some of them with me, and if we show up in town and you guys haven't done anything about what you were excited about doing, you're gonna look bad, it's gonna be embarrassing for me because I told them you're so excited to do this. And then verse 23, as for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches and in the glory of Christ. In other words, they're credentialed, they're good guys, they're people of integrity. And then he wraps it, I'm sorry, in verse four, and verse three of chapter five, I'm chapter nine. I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be empty in this case so that as I was saying, you may be prepared Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find unprepared, we, not speaking of you, will be put to shame. Let's wrap it up in verse five. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead, of, ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not be affected by covetousness. What's Paul saying? Number one, desire is ingredient one to be generous. But desire alone is not generosity. Giving is ingredient number two. And I love, I love the end of verse five. We don't want your generosity to be affected by covetousness. Everybody say covetousness. Covetousness. What is that? Well, here's what's going on. The people in Corinth were so excited to give to the folks in Jerusalem that they started saving some money and when the leaders of the church would finally get around to hacking that collection, they were gonna give that money. But as they were saving those coins and dollars, all of a sudden it became a little bit of extra money in their bank account. And you know what happens when you have a little bit of extra money in your bank account that you're not used to having. All of a sudden you think, wow, if, if I don't give all that money, I could buy a new dress for my wife. I could take the kids on a little vacation. And all of a sudden, covetousness begins to stir up in our hearts. And maybe I shouldn't give that gift to the needy folks in Jerusalem. Maybe I could spend some or all of it on us. So Paul is saying, hurry up and make that collection. Hurry up and take that offering because you don't want to put the people in your congregation at risk to covetousness. So it's so interesting. Generosity is both an attitude and an action step. It's an attitude and an action step. Now, we're gonna wrap this up next Sunday. Principle number seven, which is the rest of chapter nine. You don't, you don't wanna miss next Sunday because we're gonna talk about a practical plan of how to be generous. Because in the rest of chapter nine, Paul gets very practical. How do I do this in my family finances? And number two, we're gonna find out next week Watch this, God rewards generosity. So we wanna look at that next week. But as we close today, just let me encourage you, what, as you look at your family finances, is there a place in there for generosity? Do you have a, a planned place in your budget that when someone else is down, you can bring balance? If, if you're down, don't be afraid to ask if somebody can give a little balance. We have a deacon's fund here in our church that's only designed to help folks within our congregation who are a little bit down. And people generously give to that little fund that's not in our budget, it's something aside from our budget. And when somebody comes to us with a genuine need because they're down, because of your generosity, we have the ability to bring some what? balance in their life. Not, not to create a lifestyle for them, but just to create some balance. Do you have room in your finances for generosity to help others? Let's stand together and pray.
Lord, thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that we live in a country that is so prosperous. The reality is you could have had each one of us be born in a different country and life would not be nearly as good as it is here. Lord, we can look all over the globe and discover people groups that have life far harder than we do. And Lord, we know that we can't solve all the world's problems. And you're, you're not asking us to solve all the world's problems. But we do recognize that you brought us into this world in this place and in this generation. And Lord, you, you brought us in this place, this, this culture, this prosperous land, partly so that we could be generous. So Lord, show us how we can do this, how we can help others when they're down. And Lord, someday when we're in need, whether it's need for prayer, whether it's need for encouragement, whether it's financial need, we can be recipients of someone else's generosity so that all of us can be in balance because you love us so much. Show us how to do this in our homes, Lord. Show us how to do this in our finances, and we're grateful that you are the greatest example of generosity, that you didn't just come up with a plan to bring us salvation. You actually stepped out of heaven and acted on it, and we're the recipients of your great generosity. Thank you that you love us so much. Show us how to do this in our homes. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Have a great day. Have a great afternoon. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today at Auburn Grace. I want to do a special shout out to my friend Patricia from Southern California. There you go. Met her on Sunday morning at uh, Easter Sunday. And uh, it was great to have her up visiting, and we're so glad that you're watching online. And I know you comment, so I'm going to be looking for your comment to make sure you are at church today. That's right. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. And don't forget, if you need something, holler. Office is open Monday through Thursday, 9 to 4. And, of course, uh, stay current with the app and online. Absolutely. All right. God bless you. Today we're at um, this event for the Sowers and Rippers. Uh, we're gathering for tea and friendship. That's our theme, just to enjoy the day and the ministry that God has blessed us with. Through the ministry, we have developed friendships that have just been amazing because we can support one another, cry with one another, and just be friends. It's a real gift from God. Yeah, today there's a hundred ladies that are attending and um, Sores and Rippers that come every week and then they're guests so yes. they can find out about Sores and Rippers. Yes, we want to pass the word because it's such a wonderful ministry. We've all benefited and of course it all began with just about a half a dozen ladies and some of them are still with us today.